Hey all, Ron Coddington here from Military Images. Hope you're doing well tonight. Uh, an impromptu, unscheduled uh, conversation about uh, a photograph that I wanted to share with everyone. Uh, as some of you know, I've been busy closing the spring issue of Military Images and um, then finishing up the proofing for a book called Gettysburg Faces, which will be published uh, through Gettysburg Publishing. That's uh, Kevin Drake and his company out of Connecticut. So really excited about that. Um, but that's all uh, a week in the past. Um, I finished all that work on Monday. And so I've been turning my attention to doing some cleanup and um, cleaning up files and then going through some projects that I've been wanting to get to. Uh, which includes some photographs that I recently added to my collection. And uh, I want to talk to you about this one tonight because um, I, it, never, it, it never ceases to amaze me uh, about the connections of the Civil War generation to other places and time and other situations. And uh, um, such is the case with this photograph that um, I saw on eBay originally. And um, I, it, it did not sell. And I don't know if this has happened to you before, but um, I, I wanted to bid on it because it had a New Jersey back mark and I, I, it caught my attention, had a New Jersey back mark and I'm from New Jersey. Originally I grew up there and um, it was also identified, but um, somehow I missed the bidding and um, it closed, no one had bid on it. So I contacted the seller and said, hey, is that possibly still, still available? And um, long story short is I was able to add it to my collection. Hey, Jim, how are you doing tonight? Uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming on. Um, so I received this um, and um, I got a chance to spend some time with it today. And um, the one thing that immediately caught my attention on this image is, uh, is his leggings, which you can see here. Um, he has what appears to be um, fairly standard, a fairly standard uniform, um, with the exception of those leggings, which um, might be zouave-ish, if you will. Um, but everything else seems pretty standard. He's definitely a young guy. Um, I don't even think there's any hint of a uh, beard coming in at this point. So his youth and that uniform detail caught my attention. Um, also of note was the album page uh, that it was contained in. Um, we can see some interesting, helpful information. Uh, W.F. Allen of Bordentown uh, as captain of the Anderson Cadets of something, something. I can't read that part. Um, and then below it says, not a member. So um, some curious details there uh, inscribed on the album page. And it looks to me that the album page, the pencil writing on that album page is uh, in pencil that it could be from the Civil War period, but it looks maybe a little bit later to me. Um, so I see uh, Dale, thanks for coming on. Uh, BK, thanks for joining us from Florida. Um, hey, Laura, hope you're doing well. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for signing on. So um, I, this is the image, and um, I was quite intrigued with it. And so what I wanted to do was to try to find some more information about this. Um, I also had one other image. There were two images that, um, that came together. Uh, the reverse, the image on the opposite side of the album page turned out to be W.F. Allen's um, sister. And um, uh, the sister's name is uh, 
um, I think, uh, Belia or something like that. So, um, but looking at um, uh, this gentleman, I had to get some sense of uh, what was his first name? What was his middle name? And I had some good information. I've got that uniform uh, detail. I've got um, uh, the New Jersey back mark, um, uh, the reference to a group called the Anderson Cadets, Bordentown, um, which is a city in New Jersey. So there's a fair amount of information to work with. So um, it was pretty easy for me to do a little bit of work on Ancestry.com and, uh, and find out that, um, in fact, a William Frederick Allen uh, is, the, uh, is the name, is the full name of this young man. He was born in 1846. Uh, and when the Civil War began, he was uh, all of 14. His 15th birthday wasn't until October of 1861. So um, that led me to find a grave where there's a bit more information. Uh, it mentions uh, his father, a colonel in the 9th New Jersey Infantry. So I did a little bit of a search, little searching around, and I found that um, his father, um, who is a, a peacetime uh, uh, civil engineer, also a militia officer, uh, and guess what? The militia company that he was commander of was, you guessed it, the Anderson Cadets. And so um, that, um, that connects nicely with this photograph. I have to say I was a little sidetracked at first because I was looking for uh, my first searches for Anderson Cadets turned up a company in Pittsburgh, uh, which was um, in a different state and uh, a different part of a different state. And so that was a rabbit hole that I went down to try to figure out, hey, is this guy, although he's from New Jersey, outside of Philadelphia, um, in Bordentown, did he somehow connect to Pittsburgh? But it turns out that uh, that was a that was a that was a, a false lead, and I gave up on that. And then when I found out about um, his father Joseph, uh, that helped me to get on the right track. Thanks to uh, New Jersey um, uh, 1861 State of New Jersey report about um, all the local militias and the kind of quartermaster requisitions they made. So sure enough, not only is William's father, Joseph, mentioned, connected to the Anderson cadets, there's a requisition report, um, which gives us some details about the weapons and the equipment that uh, were distributed to these guys, to the Anderson cadets. Um, and the number 40 keeps repeating. So I assume we had uh, 40 members of the cadets. Uh, and there's two references to the Zouave style in, um, in this requisition. I believe one of them is Zouave rifles and some other Zouave equipment. So um, that sort of connects up with these leggings. Uh, I haven't been able to find other images of uh, militiamen who served in the Anderson cadets. So I have no frame of reference other than this. But um, those two requisition report mentions of uh, Zouavs helped me make something of a connection to try and explain the leggings. So um, uh, interesting to me, uh, William Frederick Allen, the young man pictured here, um, uh, uh, is not listed on the roster. He's not listed as having served in any capacity uh, in, the, in the war for in New Jersey. Um, I also checked Pennsylvania because he went to school, uh, a boarding school in Philadelphia. So no luck. I did find one William Frederick Allen, um, but the death dates don't match up and the rank doesn't match up. He's pictured here as a captain. So um, I, I came to the conclusion that he did not serve in the war uh, and he did not serve in the Anderson cadets, which adds some credence to this pencil inscription because it says not a member. So um, 
Uh, I would agree. He was not a member of the Anderson Cadets, nor was he a member of any New Jersey or Pennsylvania regiment that I could find. So um, that leads to a conclusion or some possible explanations. One of those possible explanations is that um, he uh, he he was a perhaps a, an unofficial aide to his father, which seems completely reasonable. He's a 14-year-old kid here coming up on 15. Um, and so he might have um, served in some unofficial capacity to his father um, in Bordentown, New Jersey. Another possibility is he was dressed up as a soldier, um, perhaps modeling the Zouave style uniform. Um, I'm a little, little less uh, convinced that that's a, a solid argument. Um, I do think that he probably served in an unofficial capacity, perhaps uh, as a um, uh, an aide with an asterisk on his father's staff. So an interesting detail is that his father did leave the Anderson cadets and became the colonel of the 9th New Jersey Infantry. And um, uh, in early, very early in January of 1862, the uh, Colonel Allen, um, the father of William, heads off with the 9th New Jersey and other troops for Burnside's expedition along the coast of North Carolina. Colonel Allen lives for days into the campaign. On January 13th of 1862, um, he is um, in the act of trying to get water for his men. Um, and the way I understand it, there's uh, they're in a transport. They're out at sea. Um, they're heading to North Carolina. The, uh, the troops, his men need water. He gets in a rowboat um, or some cutter with um, the regiment surgeon and someone else manning the oars. And they're making their way inland and uh, the ship, the boat, excuse me, the rowboat capsizes and they all drown. Uh, there's a later account that says something to the effect of Colonel Allen was uh, delivering uh, official orders or something to General Burnside. I think that account is probably a little bit inflated because it was written 20 plus years after the Civil War, the story about him drowning while he was getting water for his men comes out of a New York Times report that happened. Uh, that New York Times report appeared just a couple of weeks after the accident. So um, uh, that the death of his father in early 1862 leaves William and um, his two siblings um, without a father and um, his mother, Sarah, is now a widow and she has lost her husband. So um, trying to get a better sense of when this photograph was made, 1861 seems a very reasonable time frame. Um, there's no revenue stamp on the back of this image, which rules out an 1864 to 1866 date. Um, we also have uh, his father's involvement in the Anderson Cadets, which seems to end in 1861 as he moves to the 9th New Jersey. Uh, and then there's a, a sketch of William's life that I found. Um, and this one, this sketch tells us, and I'm going to read the quote here. Um, in 1862, after his father's death, he, that is William, uh, becomes a rodman on the Camden and Amboy Railroad and in 1863 was promoted to assistant engineer. He engaged in several roads, it's railroads, uh, then in the course of construction uh, in New Jersey and in 1868 was appointed resident engineer of the West Jersey Railroad and a little sidelight, founded the town of Winona, New Jersey which is uh, outside of Philadelphia. So um, here, here we're getting a glimpse of William's life from 1862 to 1868. Uh, and we're learning that by age 20, he has established himself on the railroads uh, in New Jersey. 
and he has um, founded a town. So uh, when I was 20, I wasn't able to claim any of that. So kudos to William. Um, and now we get to the point in the story where, uh, as I mentioned up front, you start to learn about individuals and you can become really fascinated about how they connect to history. Um, and in this case, how they connect to something that touches all of us regularly. So here it is. Um, let me take you, the one, when we last left off, it's 1868 and he is um, uh, working on the railroads as an engineer in New Jersey. Well, a few years later, in 1872, um, uh, he becomes assistant editor of a publication that I've never heard of. Uh, you may have, but it's called The Traveler's Official Guide. And this is a, it's a monthly magazine. Um, it has news and information in it, um, some industry stuff about railroads. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a trade publication for the railroads, but it can also be read by others that have a passing interest in it. So in 1872, he gets his promotion. Uh, in 1875, by 1875, he's now editor of the Traveler's Official Guide. That same year, he gets elected, elected, um, voted in to a position um, as permanent secretary of a group called the General Time Convention. Now, stay with me because it gets, this gets interesting. Um, uh, the General Time Convention is basically a group of railroad folks. And as I understand it, uh, these railroad folks have a problem. They have a big problem. The problem is that in the United States, during that period in the late 19th century, uh, everybody is on different time zones. In fact, according to one study, there's 144 different time zones in the United States. Now, in antebellum times, uh, and maybe uh, as the Civil War was going on, um, and transportation, rail transportation was maturing, having 144 different time zones was acceptable. Um, however, as you're getting into the 1870s and then into the 1880s, uh, those large number of time zones becomes a real problem, especially as you're trying to move goods and people across the country. Expectations are growing. Um, people want things done quickly. Sound familiar? You want things fast. You want it now. It's as true in the 19th century as it is in our century. So um, these railroad folks, they need to solve this problem of all the time zones. And they also are fearful that the federal government is going to step in and legislate and tell them what to do. So to avoid that, they basically form a task force and they figure out, hey, what, what's the options here? So um, eventually they settle on a proposal that is made by our good friend, William. Uh, William not only suggests a plan, but provides very good detail about how they could change from this huge number of time zones to four time zones. Now, you know this today, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. This guy right here is the one, he's the guy who gets the credit for not only proposing this plan, but also providing enough detail for folks to get their heads around it. And any of you who have worked in corporate America, um, you know that getting, getting, getting such a plan enacted, um, getting people together to agree, um, it's part of what we do. It's part of how we work. Um, and so he was able to put forth a plan that everyone agreed on. So not only did he propose these four time zones, but he also suggested, let's base it on Greenwich, the Greenwich medium, uh, pardon me, the Greenwich meridian, also known as the prime meridian. So um, there you have the essence of William's uh, contribution 
to the history of time, the history of rail travel, and the history of America, um, the four different time zones. Now, his efforts are recognized by, in a couple different ways, uh, the convention folks, uh, they, they pass a resolution uh, and it says, um, uh, the note here says, by unanimous resolutions of the convention, he was awarded the thanks for the accomplishments of the practical part of the work, which was principally done between August 15th and November 18th of 1883. So it took a while to get those plans in place and enacted. We're looking at a period of years, but finally in 1883, it happens. The four time zones uh, are adopted by the rail industry. They avoid federal intervention, but they incur the wrath of some of these local jurisdictions because the local jurisdictions are saying, hey, you took away the rights of our people because we based our times on uh, on what our needs are and why are you big railroad companies taking away from taking this away from us so you've got tension on the local level you've avoided the federal level so we've had a compromise here and william is cast in something of the central role for bringing this all together so it gets a little better um, than this. Uh, uh, in 1884, um, President Chester Alan Arthur, he taps William to be one of five delegates to the International Meridian Conference, which is held in Washington, D.C. And um, he's one of the speakers at the conference, and he reads his paper and that paper is called Standard Time as Adopted in the United States. That paper becomes part of the official proceedings, uh, and those official proceedings are translated into a bunch of different languages, and before you know it, countries in Europe and Asia are also adopting this idea of standard time zones. So William's idea that started with uh, solving a problem in America has um, international connections. So he's something of a celebrity in the uh, time, the world of time um, in America as a result of this. So he gets appointed to numerous um, boards and associations and societies. Uh, he's very active in all of this as a consultant. And he does this up until his death in 1915 at age 69. So he has a really interesting, a really interesting life. Really, um, who, who would have thought that this photograph that came off of eBay of this kid, this 14-year-old kid, um, goes all the way to the 1880s and to the establishment of standard time. So I learned all of this today, uh, and it's really just great. Um, I have a question from Laura. Um, asking who the person is on the other side of the page. Uh, let me get that for you. Um, her name is, uh, bear with me just a second, I'll get it for you. Um, it's his sister. Uh, and um, I haven't really done any research other than to verify that um, she was uh, the sister. And um, her name is... Uh, it looks like it's Bethia. It's spelled, I've, it's been spelled two different ways, B-E-T-H-E-A, but on Ancestry.com, it's B-E-T-H-I-A, Bethia Allen. And according to this, it looks like, according to the back of the uh, carte visite cardstock mount, um, it appears that she married somebody named Young. I haven't verified that yet. Um, but I need to check more into that. So I'm at the sort of the, that's the first day of research. Um, and so still working on that. Um, uh, Jim, thank you for the comment. That's great. Uh, BK, huzzah, back at you. That's great. Um, I also agree with you. Wealthy and powerful ran and owned the railroads. Very, very true. Um, they were in some ways, I think they're kind of like the tech giants of today. Um, there was a lot of innovative technology that was going on. And um, these guys 
had uh, had to face the possibilities of having government intervention um, to solve some real world problems or take it on themselves. And it appears that they tried to stay ahead of, uh, and, of federal legislation and um, propose their own system. So um, Isaac, you have a question here too. Um, have you managed to find a photo of him in later life? Uh, yes, I have. Um, he is uh, he is definitely. I found a photo, one photograph of him, um, and um, uh, he's older, but the eyes are still very similar looking. Um, I don't know that I have that um, uh, easily gettable at the moment, but um, I did I did find it. And so um, I may do a post on Facebook and share this information. So um, there's a, sort of a couple lessons here that I also wanted to, to pass along. Um, not only is the, I've talked about his connection to history and how great it is when you can find somebody who, um, uh, who has that deeper and longer lasting connection. But I do think that it also underscores um, something that I, I talk about a lot, which is um, the, the motto of military images um, uh, is to showcase, interpret, and preserve. Um, that interpretation part of it, when I talk about interpretation, I'm talking about doing that research. Um, and so in this case, I went far down the rabbit hole. I spent way more time um, than I expected today getting this information, but um, it, 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 it puts, um, it, it, it puts him, it puts William Frederick Allen into perspective of um, the country's history, uh, not only during the war, but beyond that. And I think it's relevant. I think it's relevant to be able to remember these individuals and the contributions they make. Um, who would have thought that a 14 year old boy who had just lost his father would turn into um, a, rail, a railroad engineer and become a private secretary, a magazine editor, and make these big contributions to, uh, to la lasting contributions to the country. So um, uh, you don't find these things out until you dig around. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I suspect many of you that are on this uh, live presentation right now or who will watch it on, uh, um, on YouTube or Facebook uh, or Twitter, um, you'll, you'll, you'll go, oh yeah, yeah, I love doing the research. And, um, and man, this is a day where I've absolutely loved doing the research. So um, really appreciate you all um, tuning in and um, uh, a plug for next week's DC photo show. If you, if you are in the um, uh, Virginia, Maryland, uh, D.C. area, um, or if you're coming into town, the show, the D.C. photo show will have, I believe, 30 tables um, of Civil War dealers. It's going to be held at the Dulles Marriott. Um, you can find information on our Facebook page. Um, also, Doug York's Civil War Faces. Um, the show is on Sunday, March 13th. It's a one-day show. On the Saturday, the day before, on Saturday the 12th, you will find um, two events that I hope you'll come to. One of them is a tour of the Balls Bluff Battlefield. It's less than a half an hour from the hotel, and it is really an interesting, fascinating place. Uh, and what happened there in October 1861 is, um, is just a really interesting part of uh, Civil War history. And we're going to have a tour guide uh, named Pat Mountain. He's, as I understand, he's one of the best. Uh, so he'll be taking us on a tour. So hope you can make it. You can find that information also on the events section of our Facebook page. That's going to happen on Saturday afternoon, March 12th. And then on Saturday evening, beginning at seven, we're going to have um, three speakers. Uh, Doug York of Civil War Faces is going to be introducing um, three speakers. Uh, the theme that Doug has created is about collecting. And so he has three folks to talk about that. Also, I'm going to be uh, having a reveal of the cover and the theme for the spring issue which uh, should arrive on Friday 
and then it will be mailed to subscribers uh, on the 14th, I believe. So stay tuned for all of that. If you're in the DC area um, next weekend, the 12th and 13th, please come by to the Balls Bluff Tour, the Saturday Night Speakers, and uh, the show on Sunday. So I hope to see you there. If I don't, um, I'll see you here online at some point. Uh, there's always text, email, et cetera, et cetera. So take care of yourselves and have a great week.